Now, from Local 24, a special presentation. The Mid-South's Hidden History, honoring black history. Good evening and welcome to the Mid-South Hidden History. I'm Katino Rankin. And I'm Brandon Artillis. We're in front of the National Civil Rights Museum, the place where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and now remembered. We're talking about people and places in black history that are rarely discussed. And during the next 30 minutes, we're going to introduce you to some of those hidden moments. And we begin where Dr. King's life ended. The Lorraine Motel was transformed from a place of tragedy to a place of tribute. The National Civil Rights Museum opened its doors in 1991. And while Dr. King is the most recognizable name of the civil rights movement, there are many others who fought on the front lines but stayed behind the scenes. Kelly Cook and the museum's lead educator introduces us to some of those hidden heroes. You've heard of Martin. I'll have you arrested. And you've certainly heard of Rosa. Rosa Parks, who so famously refused to give up her seat on a Montgomery bus to a white woman in 1955. And this is what will later become known as the birth of the civil rights movement. But what if I told you the household name of Rosa Parks could have been replaced with Claudette Colvin or Mary Louise Smith? Both, like Rosa Parks, decided not to give up their seat to a white person on the bus. And they did it the same year and in the same city as Rosa Parks. 15-year-old Colvin was arrested in March, Smith in October. These unsung heroes may be lost in many history books, but not here at the National Civil Rights Museum, where everywhere you turn is a hidden hero waiting to be found, like Bayard Rustin. Well, he does get lost in the shuffle. Who spoke before more than 250,000 people at the March on Washington in 1963. He was Martin Luther King Jr.'s right-hand man behind the scenes. And he had the pleasure of speaking after Dr. King. Talk about a hard act to follow. He goes on right after arguably one of the most important speeches that's ever given in the history of the United States. But King's I Have a Dream speech might have never happened had it not been for Rustin. Barrett Rustin, if you're looking at the March on Washington as a motion picture, he was not only the director, he was also the producer. The Westchester, Pennsylvania native had his hand in everything from training security to writing slogans to even, yes, the lineup of the speeches that day. He had to remain behind the scenes because he was openly gay. And in the 50s and 60s, it was extremely taboo. But nowhere was it more violent than Birmingham where a bus carrying Freedom Riders was bombed and dogs were sent after children. It's where Dr. King did some of his most important work. Dr. King was even arrested in Birmingham, pinning a letter from a Birmingham jail when he was arrested for defying a court order prohibiting marches. But he would have never come to Birmingham if it hadn't been for a man named Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. Reverend Shuttlesworth was leading the fight for civil rights in the most segregated city in America. His home bombed, a target of the Klan, while leading marches and protests. Shuttlesworth co-founded the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with Dr. King, and encouraged his friend to help him in the fight in the city known as Bombingham. Had it not been for the courage and insistence of Fred Shuttlesworth to invite Dr. King to Birmingham, it's unsure if segregation would have ended as a result of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964, signed the following summer. The fight for civil rights had many faces, and they have a home where they can forever be remembered. In Memphis, Tennessee, I'm Kelly Cook. The National Civil Rights Museum prides itself as being a meeting place for anyone involved in current civil rights issues. From traveling exhibits to peaceful protests, museum officials want the museum to stay relevant. Well, it was the reason that Dr. King was in Memphis back in 1968. Coming up, details on the Memphis sanitation strike and the men who walked the picket line with the civil rights leader. Robert Singstack Abbott used his newspaper, the Chicago Defender, to publish reports on racial injustice and lynching to encourage African Americans to migrate north.
You're watching the Mid-South's Hidden History on Local 24. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was in Memphis in April 1968. He was here to assist hundreds of sanitation workers who were on strike. The African American workers had been off the job for weeks. They were protesting dangerous working conditions and unfair treatment. And as the trash piled up, well, so did the tensions between the black workers and the white mayor. Rudy Williams spoke with the hidden heroes who hit the picket lines and prompted Dr. King's stop in the Bluff City. If you want something, you got to stand up. If you want to be a man, you got to stand up and be a man, not a boy. Baxter Leach was one of the Memphis sanitation workers who stood up by walking out with more than a thousand trash collectors in February 1968. Andy That's his daughter, Anika Hilliard. She owns this place, Miss Girly Soul Food Restaurant in North Memphis. She says it's a family business that may never have existed had her father not taken a stand almost 50 years ago. When I went to work for the city, they wasn't even making a dollar out. We had nowhere to wash our hands, take a bath, for nothing. We was just out there working in all that snow, rain. The deaths of two trash collectors, Echo Cole and Robert Walker, all credited with starting the two-month-long strike by black Memphis sanitation workers. The men were crushed in the back of a garbage truck when they tried to take cover from a thunderstorm. When we went out, Matteo Jones called me and told me that we're going out on strike. I told my men that night. Tio Jones was a trash collector, thrust into position as a union organizer, a role that placed him face to face with the black sanitation workers' fiercest opposition, Memphis Mayor Henry Loeb. And this is when Loeb had said to us, you better get back to work. Uh, uh, you fired. At that point, Alvin Turner had been working as a trash collector for 16 years. He says those words from an unsympathetic mayor spurred the first march of many, with Martin Luther King Jr. joining the fight in March of 1968. I got mace, I got tear gear, I got run like a rabbit, police behind me. The striking workers met nearly daily at nearby churches. Many religious leaders supported the protests of the sanitation workers, including one Reverend James Lawson, who told the sanitation workers one morning after an assault with police that at the heart of racism is the idea that a man is not a man, that a person is not a person. He told them that you are human beings, you are a man, and you deserve dignity. Out of those words, a mantra for protest and movement were born. Change came on April 16, 1968, when all the striking workers' demands were met, but at the cost of the death of Dr. King 12 days earlier. The Sanitation Workers' Union was recognized, salaries were increased, and the strike came to an end. If we never had got that union, we might not have been making, might have been making $10 an hour now. In April of 2011, eight of the surviving sanitation workers traveled to the White House to meet President Barack Obama as they were inducted into the Labor Hall of Fame. This changed the course of history. In Memphis, Tennessee, I'm Rudy Williams. The sanitation strike set the precedent for labor relations around the world. That's right, those 1,300 Memphis workers, they brought attention to job inequality, lack of health care, and housing in the black community. Well, good food plus good company equals good conversation. A Mariana, Arkansas restaurant owner has it all figured out. That's the business plan and coming up, the plan has kept them in business for years. Coming up, we're taking a look and grabbing a to-go plate at this hidden part of black history. After Memphis sanitation workers went on strike for unfair working conditions, the workers were given just a 10 cent an hour wage increase.
You're watching the Mid-South's Hidden History on Local 24. In the 1960s, African Americans sat at whites only lunch counters in protest. Barbecue can break down racial barriers and is happening at Jones Barbecue in Mariana, Arkansas. Since 1964, the African American owner has brought people together in the community, black and white, with a simple barbecue sandwich. And tonight, Donna Terrell tells the hidden story of James Harold Jones and his sauce that brings solidarity. Inside this little white building, a worker takes embers from a fireplace and puts them into a barbecue pit to smoke the meat. Jones barbecue down. It's early in the morning, but James Harold Jones has already started selling his popular pulled pork barbecue. And this is what? Lunch? Breakfast. Jones opened his business in this location in 1964, but its history is much older than that. It's believed to be the oldest black-owned restaurant in the South. He's been in the family over 150 years. My granddaddy's uncle once died. He used the same secret barbecue sauce then used today. What's the secret to this recipe of yours? What did I put in it? And Jones's father put the same thing in it. I started helping him out 14 years old, and now I'm 72. So I've been in it for a little while. A family tradition that doesn't care how much money you make. How are you, James? About 10 pounds. Or what color you are. The only color that matters here, reddish orange. I've been here since about 74. It's a special trip every year to come here and see my friend. Mayor Jimmy Williams remembers Mariana when farming and the factory where he worked for 40 years thrived. It brought in big name executives. And when they'd come in on company plane before they leave, they'd say, well, let's run down Jones's and get some barbecue. But the taste draws people from all walks of life. Do you ever get tired of doing No, no. The only thing I get tired of doing it is interview. <laughs> He gets a lot of attention these days after winning the prestigious James Beard Award for his American classic. It's the so-called Oscars of culinary work. He's the only person in the state to ever win it. It now hangs a little lopsided above the window that peers into his kitchen. But it didn't take a national award to prove his pulled pork sandwiches on Wonder Bread with a little coleslaw are good. It's like no other barbecue you ever eat. This guy told us he's been eating here for 53 years. Hey, it's so good and, and damn near make you run red light. <laughs> Ironically, in a town where most black people live in poverty, Jones's Barbecue pumps money into the economy and brings visitors to the heart of the Arkansas Delta who might not otherwise come here. Four dollars, seven dollars, or you get two of them but you better get here early. You don't have any more? I won't have no more until after one o'clock. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. See, that's, that's the way it happens, like that. See, I never know from one day to the next day, I'm, you know, how big a crowd I'm gonna have. And when it's out, it's just out. Until tomorrow, when the fire is burning and the meat is smoking, as it has for the last 150 years. In Mariana, Arkansas, I'm Donna Terrell. While most restaurants focus on variety, there are only two things on the menu at Jones Barbecue. That's right, barbecue and a barbecue sandwich. Well, Memphis is the home of the blues and the birthplace of rock and roll. So much music history on one stretch of road. Coming up, we're headed to Bill Street to be soulfully serenaded by the musical part of black history. In 1940, only 3% of African Americans were registered to vote. Jim Crow laws used poll taxes and literacy tests to keep African Americans from voting.
You're watching the Mid-South's Hidden History on Local 24. New York has Broadway, New Orleans has bourbon. Here in Memphis, we have Beale Street. It is one of the most famous entertainment streets in America, serving up Memphis blues and world famous barbecue. And just 100 years ago, this street was full of homes and only a few businesses where African Americans could shop in the Jim Crow South. John Paul takes us behind the music with a look at Beale Street's beginnings and its important role in black history through the decades. <laughs> Music is important to us because it's part of our lifestyle and our way that we communicate. On Beale Street, it's easy to see and hear. This is where the world is welcome to the South with a hearty helping of soul and a story. We use our music and our talking to share experiences and lifestyles. See, blues is a story, and no one knows it like Judy Pizer. I'm sure we have it marked somewhere. Slideshow that we did on Beale Street, yeah. What started with a few films. Candlelight tribute to Elvis from Graceland. <laughs> turned into a major archive here at the Center for Southern Folklore in downtown Memphis. It's important that we are able to, through the festival and other things, give people a stage, give people a voice, give people a way to celebrate themselves. And the center's archive brings those stories to life. We're talking about an era before Gibson Guitar opened its doors, and even before FedEx Forum moved in, and before the Westin joined the neighborhood. We're going back to a point where much of the area surrounding Beale Street was an empty lot, an empty lot that replaced many of the homes and businesses that were very much a part of the Beale Street neighborhood. We called it urban removal because about 400 buildings were removed out of that area. You still see vacant lands. Shelby County historian Jimmy Ogle told us these vacant lands were home to a thriving black community in the Jim Crow South. At the turn of the century, Lieutenant George W. Lee made this phrase that it was a mile of vice and ambition owned by the Jews, policed by the whites, and enjoyed by the Negroes. We're in a segregated city. And, and the blacks couldn't go up on the main street or other areas. By the 1880s, Robert Church, the first black millionaire in the South, bought land around Beale, and with his son, who was a political leader here, helped Beale Street take shape, building Church Park Auditorium, at the time the largest assembly for blacks in America. Then across the street was Solvent Savings and Bank, and over the decades, as the business district and the number of black businesses grew, so did the energy, especially after dark. Somebody told us years ago that I think Penny Southern Beale Street on Saturday night was like having ice cream when you weren't used to having anything but bread pudding. Beale was that fabulous night on the street, the night we put on our good shoes, the ones that hurt, you know, and went out to be seen. Music brought a who's who list of names to Beale during the 20th century. As a major African-American street, it took center stage during the Civil Rights era. The Civil Rights Movement really carried out through Beale Street as well. Dr. King, the last three big moments of his life were in Memphis, Tennessee, his big public moments. Parks and venues pay tribute to the well-known names and hidden heroes who made Beale what it is today. The sights and sounds around this world-famous street help its story live on. The most important thing is, is that we listen in Memphis, Tennessee, I'm John Paul. Following Dr. King's assassination, Beale Street suffered a major setback for most of the 1970s. Many of these shops and buildings were abandoned and boarded up. In fact, the street was fenced off. And historians, they spent much of the 80s restoring the street with a focus on the blues and making it a musical capital again. A place where blacks and whites could play together and a street of commerce. Their efforts turned it into one of the largest revenue grossing attractions in Tennessee. We Shall Overcome is the song most closely associated with the civil rights struggle but its origin goes back to slavery, when African-Americans used it as a work song.
Thank you for taking a journey with us through the Mid-South's Hidden History. I'm Brandon Artilles. And I'm Katina Rankin. Go to our website for Mid-South Hidden History moments, including one more important story of one of the heroes of the National Civil Rights Museum. That's right. We have an extended interview with Ella Baker, the co-founder of the Nonviolent Student Coordinating Committee. And Baker's work created one of the most important components of the movement. Until next time, good night. This has been a Local 24 special presentation of the Mid-South's Hidden History.